Hey everybody, how you doing? Wow, that's a hot mic. Yes. Um, hey guys, how y'all doing? Push it. You having a good time? Push it. Awesome. I've met a lot Push of you guys it, already. Man. This is uh, great, man. What a great convention it is. Good weather, good turnout. Um, all right, let's get it going. Let's get it started. What do you guys want to talk about? He you want to take questions? questions? Yeah. Oh, all right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Here we go. go. I think Jeremy's going to yeah, I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions about the last 15 minutes all or right. so. It's like, it's like Trivial Pursuit with Vince Carrazzo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Hey, who, let me ask you, who here was at the panel yesterday? All right, some, some returnees. Right so we got we got some returnees. So we're gonna try to bring over some, go over some new material today. Okay, cool. But we're also gonna talk about some of the stuff from yesterday as well. Sure. All right. So let me ask you, what is your favorite project you've ever worked on? Uh, as a voice actor or as an on camera actor? Anything. Um, I guess uh, I'll say as an on camera actor, uh, one of my favorite projects was uh, Bonanno, a Godfather story. I played Lucky Luciano. Uh, which was kind of cool. It was a mini series. It won an Emmy, um, and uh, it was just cool to play uh, such an iconic uh, figure, historic figure, um, and just to learn about that. Plus, the, you know, there was some prosthetic stuff with the eye, and um, which was cool. It was just cool getting into character, and it was a, a cool project. Um, and as a voiceover actor, that's tough. I, I like them all. I mean, there's, there's something, there's something sort of um, personal about all of them that you know you bring to the table um, I mean of course I have a, a, a major soft spot for Tuxedo Mask and Darian because it's such a <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is why a lot of you guys are here so I think that's part of the reason why I have a soft spot for it when I see your faces and I see uh, you know the fans who just it just I know how much it means to you guys and uh, it was a pretty awesome show to be a part of. The cast was amazing. It was a great group of people that some of them are still great friends to this day. I've known them for like 20 years. And, um, so I think that's uh, one of the main reasons for uh, for Sailor Moon and Tuxedo Mask. And also, um, uh, I, I really enjoyed playing Shigga Dance and Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. That was a <laughs> Just because I was the youngest cast member, I was 22 at the time, it was my very first animated job, and I played uh, the oldest cat, uh, guy in the cast, uh, Shiga Dance, and it was a fun voice, you know, to be 22 years old and being like, Ventura, I can hear them in there scratching around. <laughs> the rent is due, Ventura. It was, uh, it was a fun voice to play, and I actually ended up uh, doing a reading with the, the gentleman who played the role in the movie, and uh, terrible, it's his, his name's gone out of my head, he's Jim an Carrey. iconic, no, no, not oh. Jim Carrey, no, the guy who played Chicken Dance. Oh. Um, he's a great character actor, he's been in tons of films, and um, we actually sat beside each other at a table, we were doing a reading for a, a feature, um, and so we and I ended up telling him about it, and he just, and the whole time he just kept looking at me as I was telling him the story, and then as soon as I finished, he just went, but you're so young. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that was kind of cool, and I think that, uh, I also have a soft spot for that role because it's the very first animated job I ever did. It's my very first role that I played. I just graduated from Ryerson University in Toronto, so thanks, Alex. Um, so I had a soft spot for that. Uh, on camera, the other role that I, sh I, I always like to mention is I was the last detective to join the force on NYPD Blue. So I was in the very final episode of series finale, which was, which is pretty awesome, and, and it was quite an honor to be so. And they, the the cast was so amazing because they really embraced me and made me feel like I was part of their, you know, group. Even though I was just like the last detective for one episode, the very season finale, the series finale. Um, but they were so nice, and Dennis Franz and just, uh, the entire cast was just really, really sweet and, and great. And I, I, I felt like I was part of the team, you know. And I kept saying the whole time we were shooting that I was like, J could we just maybe do one more season? <laughs> Go ahead. All right. The next question that I have is for people who may not be uh, uh, familiar with all the work you've done, could you go ahead and list some of the highlights from your resume uh, that for, for some people like that may know you from uh, Tuxedo Masks, but may not know you from a few, few other things? Sure. Um, some of you probably are fans of Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. Yeah. I was excited in that. Um, I hate doing this. I hate this part. <laughs> so, Sorry. It was, so where it's like the laundry list. Here's my resume. Um, I was, as I mentioned, Ace Venture, Pet Detective. I was Shake a Dance. I was Alden Jones on Brace Face uh, for three seasons. Um, uh, I just, I can't. 
tuxedo mask, of course. I mean, the Jackal Johnson and the Cheetah Girls. I don't know if you guys know the Cheetah Girls from Disney. Yeah, the Jackal keeps it real. <laughs> Uh, I did a lot of Disney shows. Uh, I was Plunkett in Jet Jackson, the famous Jet Jackson. I was uh, Albert in a movie called Quince, but uh, Cheetah Girls is one of the bigger ones. Um, Bride of Chucky. I don't know if you guys are fans of the Chucky yeah. series. No. Jennifer Tilly sliced my neck open. Yeah. Uh, I was covered in uh, red dye for a couple days. Uh, <laughs> that was an interesting role. Um, <laughs> I remember that, the scene, they wanted to do an extreme close-up. The, the uh, DOP of the movie, uh, is Ron, I believe it's Ronnie Wu, he was the DOP from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Uh, or Hidden Dragon, Crouching Tiger, he's like, did I get that right? Is it the opposite? I do that all the time. Is it Crouching Tiger, Hidden Just not the Hidden Tiger and the Crouching Dragon. Right? <laughs> all right, something's hidden, something's crouching. Right? It's a dragon, it's a tiger. Um, and uh, they wanted to do this extreme close-up to open it. Uh, of me smoking this cigarette and uh, as I light the lighter and then they were panning really slowly as I take this huge drag and we must have shot like at least 20 takes and honestly I was I turned green from the smoke from some sucking and all that smoke and they had to powder me down and put so much makeup on so that I didn't look like I was about to throw up so and then right after that they sliced my neck open and I had to hang out of a car and have blood pouring out of my face so uh, always fun um, Anyways, those are some of the highlights. I'm sure there's other stuff that you guys know, and I, I you know, I, I always get embarrassed when I have to list stuff. <laughs> oh. No, and in one of the earlier panels, we were, uh, we were actually talking about theater, and we actually had a little talk about this yesterday on our own, but I kind of want to bring it, bring it back to this, just because as a theater, theater man myself, I have absolute love for it. We actually have a place in common, mm -hmm. Starlight Theater up in Kansas City, Missouri. Yes, I guess. And could you tell us a little bit some of the theater shows you've done as well? Well, I'm uh, a theater graduate of acting from Ryerson University in Canada, uh, with honors. <laughs> I like to always add that. It means I didn't suck. <laughs> and um, uh, I, when I first graduated, I did uh, a lot of theater, and I actually thought all I would do was theater. I, I, my plan was to go to Stratford in Canada. I don't know if you guys know Stratford. Uh, and, and, uh, it's just outside, it's outside of London. In Toronto, it's an iconic uh, theater. And they do Shakespearean plays, and that's what I thought I would do for most of my life. And then suddenly, I started doing voiceovers and on camera. Went, this is way more cool. Um, you know, I mean, there's nothing like playing Macbeth and King Lear and Hamlet, but yeah. <laughs> but but the, I, I, my passion became voiceover and on camera. Uh, and I've done musical theater, and recently, a couple years ago, my wife and I uh, we toured uh, the U.S. doing Mamma Mia. The National Tour of wow. Mia. I played Harry Bright, the British dad, in it, <laughs> uh, which was fun. I got to play the guitar. I got to be on stage with my wife. It was a pretty amazing time. And I actually, I had been away from theater for almost 10 years. I hadn't been on a stage in 10 years. And uh, that was my comeback to the stage. And I uh, debuted at the Starlight Theater in Kansas City, which is an 8,000 seat outdoor theater. And uh, it was pouring rain that night. Uh, and all you could hear was like just the pounding rain on the audience, and then uh, some. They had they brought in a busload of people, and somebody started free. They, we heard this screaming in the background. <laughs> it, was, it was the wildest night to come back to the stage, pitch black with rain pouring down, singing, doing Mamma Mia, and I was just like, wow, this is wild. Eight thousand people, um, but uh, yeah, so that was a, that was a blast. It was amazing to do that, and then I closed it in Wolf Trap uh, in front of nine thousand people. The tour we closed the tour to outdoor theaters, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I love the stage. I don't know if any of you are stage people, but uh, support the theater. <laughs> All right, the, que the next question I have is, how is it hard to transition going from a voice, or from a traditional, uh, ha having a traditional background in theater into uh, a genre of, of acting, which just really is from your neck up? Because like, I'm, I'm sure when you're in the, the voice studio, you have to have the emotions on your face because it's reflected through the, through the microphone. So how is it different than, uh, from, how is it different making the transition from being a, a traditional actor into a voice actor? Gotcha. Uh, I think what Jeremy's trying to say is that I have the face that's perfect behind, to be behind a microphone. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, it's actually a great question. Um, you know, uh, I often say that there is no difference 
in terms of creating a role. You still approach it from creating the character. You still, um, you know, you still want to find the motivation for the character. What does that character want? What's uh, what's stopping that character from getting what they want? Um, so those sort of uh, aspects are always the same. And if you can raise those stakes high enough, then you create more drama. You, you know, we're always. Conflict is the heart of everything that we do because without conflict, there's no interest, right? We always want to, you know, villains. The, the simplest way is, you know, in a lot of the video games or a lot of animated stuff, it's, you know, superheroes and villains. Um, but, you know, in regular life, it's also finding the conflict in relationships and stuff, and that's what makes us interested. That's what makes us care about these characters and why we, you know, relate to them so much. So that element is always the same to me as an actor. I mean, I always approach it that way. Um, but of course, uh, with on camera, you know, you are, uh, it's, it's all aspects, it's, there's the physical part of acting, there's the subtext that's played out, you know, that you, the things that you don't say that you are saying with your body. In voiceover, you don't have that uh, luxury at all, so subtext sometimes is really subtle. You have to play it in your voice, so, you know, uh, and so, so there are some very technical things that you learn to create, uh, in terms of creating tension or conflict or you know even if it's even if it's not a, a heavily com conflicted scene you know there's ways to manipulate your voice to bring out you know to, to almost show like pain and suffering you know or you tighten the, the voice and so there's a lot of technical aspects that you learn over time which is which is really cool um, and of course the other thing which is amazing about being a voice actor is you get to do things sometimes that you could never ever do um, you know, I I could never play. I, no one would hire me to be Shika Dance in Ace Ventura when I was 22 years old, right? I mean, they hired that gentleman who was 70 years old. But as a 22-year-old, there I am doing Ventura. I can hear them in there scratching around. <laughs> you know, you get to play things that you could never play in real life. Um, that's the beauty of being a, a voiceover actor. You know, you get to throw magical roses that somehow <laughs> save the world. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's one of the coolest things I, I have to say about voice acting. Um, but the transition, there, there, are, there are a lot of technical things, and you know, if anybody's interested in doing voiceover, I would highly recommend taking some classes and stuff, because being in front of a microphone and learning how to manipulate the mic is, um, uh, is a big part of doing what we do. I hope that answers the question. Oh, that did, that did. Artie, the next question that I have, uh, actually, just, just a second, I saw someone raising their hand. All right, we're going to do a Q&A session for about the last 15 minutes at this panel. And then following that, he's going to be doing a autograph and picture taking uh, a session right over where the Cutie Mark Cafe is, is going on, where they're selling the buffets as well. So it's a perfect chance to kind of go over there, meet him, ask him some questions. Right now, I'm just going to be asking a few, a few more questions up here, okay? Yeah, let's do it. All right. The next question I had was when, when you're working in a uh, voice studio, how, how, how do you come about really developing a, a character when, like, if, if, you, if, you, if you're an act, uh, if you're doing a theater show, for instance, you could act, act out the part where when you're doing a, a video game, for instance, where you only know a certain, uh, certain aspects of, of, of the scene or what's going on, how do you use that to actually develop your characters? Um, you see what I'm asking? Uh, I think so. When uh, resources, like not being able to play the game, or know, or know the full story of what's Well, a lot of that comes from the director. I mean, a lot of, we get a, a lot of the information from the director and, uh, you know, the, and oftentimes with video games, uh, there's quite a few people that usually show up in the room, the, uh, <laughs> the representatives, of, like, especially if it's, you know, something like Kingdom Hearts, you know, you'll get uh, producers like the people who have developed the game for years and they know the whole history of it. Um, so they'll give you oftentimes right there and then, you know, I don't get the scripts in advance sometimes. Um, you just get the information, you're told this is what's happening, uh, and you immediately have to jump right in and, and create that reality. And so um, I think the biggest thing about voiceover, uh, acting in general, you have to have a vivid imagination. You have to completely be able to create the, you know, what is happening and, and the reality for yourself and shut out everything that's going on around you. Um, and your imagination is the most important uh, part of that. But with voiceover, it's, it's doubly so. Um, you really have to be able to visualize, you know, when, for example, tuxedo mask, that my tuxedo suddenly appears on me and I'm, you know, floating in the air and throwing roses. And you really have to visualize, like, if you're being attacked, like, what that, you know, the, the impact of, like, a, 
You know, sometimes it's something weird that's hitting you. It's a, uh, you know, it's like icicles or something. So that might hit you a different way, and you have to really be able to kind of visualize what that, how that might affect, you know, an impact on you as opposed to just a standard punch or, you know. And so that is, it's, it's, uh, as I said, that that is doubly important. And um, and sometimes we don't get too much information. We don't get a lot of time to prepare. You know, you walk in a room, they're like, "Here's what's happening. Go." <laughs> You're like, whoa, wait a second. I, I need a minute just to figure all that out, all that detail. You know, I, I, I'm going to tell you guys a story. This is one of my favorite stories to tell. Do you guys know who Frank Welker is? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, you should know who Frank Welker is. He's a legend. Uh, if you